Last Tuesday, 294 churches, charities, and civil rights organizations said no. They rose up, refused, and said no. The statement they released in response to the government's so-called illegal migration bill says this. This senselessly cruel act will have a devastating impact on people's lives. It turns our country's back on people seeking safety, blocking them from protection, support, and justice at a time they need it most. These 294 signatories have pointed out, along with many others, that it remains unclear whether this act is even legal under the European Convention on Human Rights. So this is the country we live in now. This is the decision that was made a short walk from here in Westminster. The director of the Jesuit Refugee Service, Sarah Tether, said this in response to the act. She said, it drags any sense of the UK's moral leadership on the world stage headlong into a gutter of hate. In it, we have abandoned the principle of refugee protection and denied that we have a duty to anyone else in the world. We haven't even done this, she says, to achieve any useful end, but reveled in sheer performative cruelty. What a place it is, the gutter of hate. That sounds like hell on earth. What an action this is, sheer performative cruelty. That's what gets produced when people's hearts and minds are trapped in that gutter of hate. We believe in the infinite worth and infinite dignity of every person and of the whole of creation. That's what Christians believe. God made human beings in God's own image. This is the only holy reality with which we have to contend when exploring the dignity of a human being. It's the truth that we have to deal with in all its risk and hardship and its joy and hope too. So then it's our job as Christians to treat every person with the dignity they deserve because every person, you and me and all of the people walking past on Piccadilly right now and every day, the people who will be trapped in barges in Dorset, every person is infinitely worthy of that dignity. Here at St. James's, our refugee and asylum seeker support strives for that dignity in our own small way. And this need at the sharp end of the UK's hostile environment is more urgent than ever. And so here in our church, in our streets and our parish, our local neighborhood, in St. James's Square's clubs and Soho's cafes, in the shops on Regent Street, in Whole Foods and Burberry, among the office workers and rough sleepers, the diamond wearers, and everyone who gathers here from far and wide re wearing red. And I tell you that from up here, I have the best view of people's red clothing today. There is some great stuff going on here. There's some red ties. There are some very nice color combinations. It's all absolutely splendid. You can't see this, but I have painted my toenails red for the day. I have. And so for all of these people, here and near and far, it is St. James's day. It's his day. We say St. James, and we say St. James's as a church and as a region, as this neighborhood. We associate St. James especially with the Camino and the Santiago de Compostela, the way that that comes forward for each of us into our own way here of exploring pilgrimage. 
We say his name every day. We proclaim it every day. But sometimes it can be easy to forget who he is, how he's described in the gospel and in Acts, how we can follow him the way that he followed Jesus. And so I invite us all each day, and today especially, to be inspired by what we know, what little we know about St. James and what he stood for and how he did what he did. Today feels really personal for me as well, because 364 days ago, I arrived here as your associate rector. I received my license from the Bishop of London with its big red seal on fancy cream paper. When it became official, it became real in a new way for me as well as, and I'm sorry to say, for all of you. I do my best to serve this place and to support each one of you every day. Like anyone else, clergy or church wardens or anybody else associated with this community or beyond, all I can do is my best. And I'm grateful beyond words, though I think now you all know that I talk a lot, so beyond words means a lot. I am grateful beyond words today. And what I promised myself I would not do is cry while speaking about gratitude to all of you and to this place in that way. But quite frankly, especially some of you know here today that I also cry really easily. So it is really meaningful, but I also, I cry really easily. I'm noticing that Lucy's smiling. I cry all the time. So there you go. <laughs> I'd like us now to take a moment together, whether you're here for the first time or whether you've been coming here for decades, to slow down and look around you. Look at this courtyard. Look at the church. And look at the people, perhaps with fresh eyes and ears open, senses alert, hearts and minds open. And notice something. Notice anything. Let your attention rest upon it. The trees, the stones, the city's sounds, the reflections in the shining windows in the church, anything you like. And find yourself, if you feel you can, grateful for God's embrace in the present moment. God is here. The divine heartbeat of the world, broken-hearted and open-hearted in the Eucharist and in our bodies and our souls, is with us. God is with us. And in this attentiveness to the present, the fullness of being alive, whatever our experience of life and wherever it may lead us on our pilgrimages, individually and together, here and elsewhere, it's a place to start as we figure out the ebb and flow of life, whatever it brings. And it also may be a useful place to start because I really want to talk about an aspect of St. James's and an aspect of St. James. It's about justice. And in James the Apostle's case, it's also about a kind of rough, unbridled anger the brother of the Apostle John, these two siblings among the first to be called to follow Jesus, appears alongside Peter and his brother at crucial moments in Christ's life. James sees the transfiguration high on a mountain with Peter and his brother, and he, like them, has no idea what to make of it. Who would? Jesus shows that he's fully divine. He's God's son radiating with unknowable, strange, holy light. And so, of course, James loves it. He wants to stay there forever. And he loves Jesus. And he's totally confused. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus goes to a Samaritan town, and they don't perceive who he is, and they don't receive him with love in that place. 
So James and John get very angry. They're enraged and defensive. They assume that everyone, no matter who they are, will perceive Christ's importance the way that they do. And so their solution is violence. That's what they suggest. They ask Jesus if he could, perhaps, with just a tiny miracle, obliterate the entire village, burn it to the ground with everyone in it. And this is a heartbreaking demonstration of how little they know. Jesus' love and even his anger is inherently nonviolent. He does not want to destroy or kill people. He doesn't want to shame them. He doesn't want to damage them. And so Jesus' response is actually to be angry with James and John. The Bible doesn't tell us if Jesus said anything to them, but the Bible does tell us that James and John were rebuked by Jesus somehow. And so they walked on together, trying to absorb Jesus' reaction and hopefully learning from it. Jesus is angry because James and John have yet to learn about where love can take you and what love can feel like, especially in the midst of rejection. That learning will have to shape their steadfastness, especially at the crucifixion and long after Christ has died. There is a tradition, too, that James is present on the road to Emmaus. He has no idea then that the person he's talking to is Jesus. When Jesus agrees to eat with the people he has been walking with, he breaks the bread and blesses it and disappears. The response of those left in the room is that their hearts burn within them. That is a different kind of fire. And so James has learned something new about love. When he's left in that room with that meal on that night, he contemplates his future in light of that love and what he should do next. And in our gospel this morning, James and John's mother wants something special for her sons. She wants something that will show them and show her how loved they are. That seems to be the goal. She wants them to be next to Jesus, not only now but forever, not only on earth but in heaven. And this in itself is a beautiful idea, but the hierarchy it suggests is based on a kind of power play which is all about the desire for superiority. It's meant to be love, but it ends up being pride, and so it's a toxic route for all of them to disunity. Perhaps, they think to themselves, James and John are better than the other ten, whatever better might mean. Perhaps mothers for Jesus' friends are gathered all around that day. Maybe they were all there advocating and pushing their sons forward. We're not told. But we know that the other ten are in pain. They are envious and resentful. This indicates that no one knows what's being asked, what Jesus' life will look like in the days ahead, what love really looks like and what mark Jesus will leave on their own lives. Another example of the relationship between anger and a distorted view of what love is and what love can do. Jesus takes them seriously, though. He says they don't know what they're talking about, but he doesn't say no. He just says that if they really want what they say they want, it will be painful and costly because being a sign of God's love in a world full of violence will create suffering. Abuse of power, oppressive forces, the cruelty of this world, all of that will come for them and potentially consume them and kill them. There is a line from Martin Luther King Jr. who was, of course, himself assassinated and this line appeared on the St. James's Twitter feed a couple of days ago as a quote of inspiration. Here's what he said. We must accept finite disappointment, but we must never give up infinite hope. And so in this conversation, we have an example of Jesus accepting finite disappointment 
in his closest friends, and their inability for now to see what his life and death and resurrection will mean. And through sacrificial love, Jesus also carries infinite hope. And more than that, Jesus, because he is the Son of God, is the source of infinite hope. In the reading from Acts, James himself carries the infinite hope and the finite disappointment of living in violent oppression and carrying on with his mission anyway, however long the road, because he made a choice. Jesus has died and risen and will come again in James's life now in Acts. And so in the face of abuse of power and Herod's abuse of power, no less, James goes on, he walks forward and faces fear. He tells the truth and he dies for it. I wonder if he remembered the conversations he had with Jesus and what they felt like at the time and how they have settled with him now that the universe has changed forever. In the Gospel of Matthew this morning, Jesus asks, are you able to be what I'm asking you to be? And James and John, the brothers, quickly reply, yes, definitely. At that point, they have no idea what they've agreed to. In the reading from Acts, we see briefly something of James's life grown up with a mature faith, courageous heart, and prophetic anger. He is living his life with that infinite hope. And it's not just for him. It's for a whole group of people who follow Jesus. What a powerful threat they must have been to attract the attention of the oppressive nation state. In his discussion of Acts, Willie Jennings points out that the name of this group following Jesus, Christianoi, was not a badge of honor in Greek, but of ridicule. He says it was like a new song that announces a new time in present time. It may often seem and sound strange. Christian, he says, always equals a strange new future. Jennings continues, the spirit speaks to us of what afflicts the world. It's our birthmark and our inheritance. We hear too that Agabus in Acts does what prophets do. He speaks out against suffering and insists that vulnerable people deserve dignity and respect. James does what he must do. He is present with this Christian group, speaking out against suffering and offering infinite hope. When James is killed by the state, political opposition to the gospel is deployed to silence not just the ones who speak about Jesus, but the whole of the Jesus movement. The promise of love as the source of real power is too terrifying for those who believe that the source and the purpose of power can be achieved through fear. The satisfaction that comes from killing a message of love is a cruel satisfaction. This St. James's Day, as we travel back in time to the moment in Acts when James tells the truth, finally gets the story of love right and faces the power of the state head on, is a good day to tell the truth and to share the truth about human dignity. Because with Parliament making the devastatingly cruel decisions about migrants that it is making, and the human cost of this cruelty, Christianity as fierce love in action can be inspired by our church's patron James and by his infinite hope. Amen. <laughs>